Okay, folks, so we'll have a look at um, the role of digital technology and social media um, as a learning support system in project based learning. So I'll start off with a definition for project based learning, which obviously differs in different disciplines, but this is the one. Um, that I found most uh, useful as a kind of overarching, so a method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to engage in a complex question, problem or, or challenge. So projects, as you'll know, can be individual, they can be groups of, of students, they might result in an outcome which could be a report, typically a dissertation would be like that, presentation, poster, if it's the creative areas, it could be artifacts or in computing, it could be a prototype, it could be software, that, that kind of thing. An additional aspect to project work is that we quite often ask students to reflect on what they've done, or there's an evaluation at the end of that. Um, and that will differ depending on whether it's an individual person or whether it's a group. So if you've got a group project, then an individual reflection is a way to kind of verify the marks and a useful way to um, distinguish who's doing what. So what I've done with this particular project that uh, I've been involved in is to start to look at the key stages of the project. So I've come up with seven key stages which isn't exactly linear because you go a bit backwards and forwards but I've come up with, you would start off with a question. So you're either going to give your students a question or in the case of a dissertation they would come up with their own question and then they'd start to plan out how they want to take that with some questions, then they go into the research, they start to produce some writing, um, some evidence of what they've um, gathered, and then the feedback, seeking feedback and reflecting part of it is a really important part of that, that process, so they'd use that to improve on the work, so it's a bit of going backwards and forwards, and then eventually they're going to present that outcome, that product, whatever it is, whether it's a report or poster or um, whatever, and then there's this opportunity to evaluate it, or that evaluation in the form of a dissertation could actually be <coughs> part of the um, final output. So adapted from uh, Laffey, he's looked at project processes and the importance of actually setting students' goals, but actually breaking those down into objectives and planning those objectives and giving it a bit of a timeline. Now certainly with our dissertations, we get the students to sort of look at the different aspects that they're going to have to contribute to uh, a dissertation. And they would come up with their own timeline, which is usually quite ambitious. That's one of my students at the back, <laughs> although he's keeping to his, but others, you know, I'm going to have my dissertation done before Christmas, and uh, no, it's not, so it's not quite done. <clears throat> so... We know that within a project, students are going to be um, engaging in lots of um, various different activities, and if they can start to reflect on how those are going and capture that information, then they're going to be more readily able to reflect on it better um, at the very end. But what I've found with my students, or some of my students, is that they can go through this process, but when they actually have to come to evaluate it, it's like, oh, where did I put that information? They might have had a notebook, post-its, a scrappy piece of paper. Um, they haven't got all the information all together. Now, sometimes the students have recorded it digitally. So they've used their phone, made some notes, they've had their iPad, they might have sketched it out. They're using these digital tools and that has actually been very useful um, when they've come to the end looking at the project because they've got those digital artifacts, assuming they haven't lost them, <laughs> if they have a pen drive or something. So missing bit of the puzzle for the reflection bit um, is, is the area of concern. <coughs> so we know in those of research um, around um, the fact that if students learn how to reflect, and they're asked to do this in lots of different ways, and you might have it as um, you know, distinct as part of their PDP, but they've got to reflect on their learning activities. Some have uh, learning logs and, and diaries and stuff. It does actually impact on the learning. It's, it's useful, so we know it's, it's good. However, reflective actions, uh, activity, should I say, um, 
students don't always engage with it, they don't get it. Um, I know there's four students in this, this room have to write diaries, the learning logs, and it's kind of something that's done to you. <laughs> People don't always get it. So it's a concern really that they're not valuing that as, as an activity. <coughs> So when I was reading around um, some work by uh, Ryan Deppley, um, to actually get students to this stage with a proactive and engaged rather than being sort of passive about what they're doing, just doing it for, for the sake of it, um, they need to build confidence in that exercise of re reflection uh, and they need to do that under their own steam, not just because they're being told to do it. And there's got to be this sense of relatedness to the, the project itself. So I found that it's really important at the beginning of the project to get students to think about what reflection is, how to do it, and where to capture it. So this year, um, post-clearing, I had the opportunity to take course leadership for a new foundation degree in computing. So I anticipated <coughs> getting about 10 or 15 students and ended up with 36, but that's, a, that's another story. But one of the things I really wanted to build into this is to get them to use reflective blogs using a digital toolkit, and I'll come to that in a little while. So an important part of students' learning, as, as you probably know, is the fact that we need to um, scaffold their, their learning. If we're introducing them to something new, you can't just, I guess, push them in the deep end. But sometimes, without realising it, that's exactly what we're doing, and I've done it myself. So we've got an opportunity to think about, if we're going to ask them to um, reflect, <coughs> do we say, just go and write 500 words of reflecting on your learning with no structure, or do we provide context, introduce a structure that they can look at, and encourage multimedia formats. So students that find it difficult to write, they can use another format. So they could mind map it or they could audio it, they could video it, they could capture information by um, photographs and use that multimedia blog as a, as a repository to um, capture that information. The other thing that I thought was useful or did become useful was looking at reflection outside of university to give them some examples. So this is used in the army and it kind of simplifies um, Reflection as you know, what did we set out to do? What actually happened? Why did it happen? And what will we do next time? Rather than the descriptive reflection that we sometimes <coughs> I did this and I did that, and they don't actually think about their contribution and what they've actually learned. Another example is in sport. So this is an, uh, a form here where they're sort of reflecting on it on a game. And what they say in sport, which you might be slightly different, but there's this. Is it best to reflect just after you've done something or have time to think about how it's, it's gone? So not that immediacy or, or it went terribly wrong because you're obviously a bit depressed. If you wait a little time, you can look at it and think, okay, it wasn't so bad, but I realise now I could have done this in a slightly different way. You may all be familiar with the, the Gibbs reflective cycle, but if not, it starts off with a description of what happened, Feelings, what we're thinking and feeling, evaluation, what was good and bad about the experience, analysis, what sense can we make of the situation, conclusion, what else could you have done, action plan, if it rose again, what did you do? So this is my starting point to get the students um, thinking about reflection. But I introduced this and gave them some examples of what they could do for each of those six sections. Um, so what they had is some worksheets with those at the top and then they could put their reflections underneath. So that's the first three and that's the second three. So it's actually giving them some examples here of what they could do for each of those, those stages rather than just saying, go and write 300 words, 500 words or, or whatever. <clears throat> so another quote here about um, scaffolding the fact that it's you know, transitional. You know, you can scaffold things to start with. So if that's the first time they've ever used reflection, then you'd go through this process a second time. You might not have to go through so much detail because they'll be familiar, but you might still want to re reinforce that um, with them. 
Another piece of work that I've come across, uh, and bearing in mind this is 1998, uh, this is Lafayette at all. He talks about using technology to support um, students and define this as the digital support <coughs> system. So there's two parts to it, the instructional, where the tutor scaffolds and coaches and introduces them to various aspects of what they've got to do. And then for the students learning, we get to planning this, planning and resourcefulness, knowledge rep representation, communication, collaboration and reflection. We'll come back to those in, in, a, in the next section. So here we put structural supports to assist novice learners in the performance of tasks for which they'd otherwise be unprepared. Uh, coaching is a fairly straight, straightforward response to learning task performance, <coughs> which are targeted to bring in the learner closer to expert performance. But it's the next stage that's particularly interesting, where he talks about using tools to help them with planning um, when they're involved in research projects. And then this knowledge representation and re-representation of their ideas, that, that unfolding of how they actually interpret what they're doing with their, their research. And then this exchange and sharing of ideas. So in group projects, you know, students had the opportunity to use very early, this is 1998, technology to um, get feedback, to collaborate and discuss within um, their groups. And then tools to actually um, evaluate what they've done. But that, well, that was very interesting um, and kind of fed into what I was doing and some previous work that I'd done. And this was a, a digital toolkit that I put together for people that were wanting to create a portfolio of work and eventually provide themselves with a public portfolio. Example would be a LinkedIn profile. So you could capture information in a private blog um, and use all of these different tools, so there's kind of audio curation tools, screen captures, video and images. Um, so that was kind of something as well that I thought could be useful to feed into this idea of the digital toolkit, a modern day toolkit. But what I wanted to get to is one that would empower the learners to choose what they wanted to put in that toolkit rather than being prescript prescriptive. Um, so, you know, the, the idea was to give them some choices and try um, new and different things rather than me saying let's just use Blackboard, there's a Blackboard blog there, put everything in and you'll be fine, um, which doesn't tend to work. So taking an ice cream as an analogy, if you think about technology, you know, if you've only ever had or, or you taste vanilla ice cream for the first time, you're going to think that's fantastic because ice cream's great, I think ice cream's great anyway. So that's all you tasted, you know, you're gonna stick with that, that one tool. Whereas we know there's a whole host of other tools, but then if you decide to have every flavor under the sun, you're probably going to be sick because it'd be a bit rich and, you know, over overkill. So what I recognized was that students and staff don't necessarily know the tools that are available. So what I did was an exercise with um, the foundation degree and looked at the seven stages, starting with a question of a project and introduced them to a variety of different tools. So their quest was to work on a project. Um, they had a very simple project um, to undertake in the session <coughs> and it was to plan a Christmas party for the executive team of the university. So they had to do some research because they hadn't a clue who those people were and they had to kind of plan it out. So it was very simple, they didn't have to get very down with what the complexity of the project was, but the idea was to introduce them to these various different um, tools that are available. So we started with the questions, so some examples there, um, we're obviously just using your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is the most powerful tool that we've, we've got. You can use notes, you can use audio without even looking at any apps. Um, and then the examples here are Dragon Recorder, Evernote, Notability, Google Docs, WordPress, Padlet, um, and OneNote. Interestingly, in the foundation degree, there are a mix of um, students straight from school and college, and there's also mature students. And quite a few of the students have never used Google Docs. And they were quite fascinated with this new way of doing it because they'd only used Word documents. So we can't make assumptions that, you know, people are gonna come in and know what these apps are. 
So then we go on to plan. Um, and again, it will depend whether it's an individual project or a group project. A group project, obviously, is going to be more collaborative work. Um, so within there, there's tools like Slack and Trello, which are used extensively um, by various different um, pathways, careers in, in computing. It's quite a popular thing, particularly in software engineering. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was that authenticity of actually this is what's being used in the workspace. And in the new year, I've got um, some people in the industry coming in to talk about using these tools. So it's not just me saying, you need to have a look at these. <laughs> um, and clearly, you have to be careful, because by the time they finish their degree, you know some of these might have fallen off the way, and new tools come in. But it's that exploration. It's getting them to think about um, exploring the tools. So being able to have a hangout and, and work outside of the classroom WhatsApp, they're already using, Facebook groups are already using, they, they um, set that up themselves, um, but there are other tools in, in there. And then going on to research, obviously going through those exercises of, you know, going beyond Google and Wikipedia, looking at Google Scholar, but then how do you capture the information that you've got? So there's obviously social bookmarking tools, there's the new RefMe app, which if not tried or introduced to students, it's absolutely amazing. Would you vouch for you use it? Yeah. 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 It's, it's really good. I mean, you can go in the library and swipe and it will come up on your, um, your list of, of references. So lots of different things in, in there. And for the visual learners, they might want to capture their research by pinning articles, particularly if there's an image obviously in there. They can pin that onto a, a Pinterest board and that's a visual way to get um, them to recall what they've captured for their research project. And then there's the producing, so typically students are asked to you know, create a, a Word document for, for a report, but you know, there's no reason why they couldn't use other spaces creating a website. Um, they could use Google Docs, and certainly as a collaborative project, that's become really popular, um, because they can work on that auto saves and all the things that, that we know about. Less use is things like um, OneNote or uh, Wiki Spaces. And an opportunity to um, improve on things. There's lots of different ways where they can capture, you know, whether it's a screen capture to get some feedback, um, you know, post that to the tutor and um, Jing's a nice tool work for the snipping tool. Or just asking um, tutors or the collaboration between the peer group to use comments within a, a Google document. And then there's a presentation. One of the things I'd say is, you know, obviously there are things that you ask for in a, an assessment, but who's to say as students why you couldn't challenge that and say, well, actually, rather than presenting it this way, could I not, you know, use something else? And in terms of presentation tools, we've got Sway, Prezi, there's lots of different, you could create an infographic using PictoChart, Hacking Deck, um, or it could be more of a video um, approach. But the students didn't know about these tools, so you know, obviously it comes back to they don't know what they don't know, so <coughs> it's, it's useful to let them have a look at that and experiment to see if they're going to be useful. And then it finishes off with the evaluation. Okay. <clears throat> so the primary aim really is, is to get them thinking about reflecting as, as they go on. Now, the students <coughs> that I'm working with for the extended degree have a blog. It's, it's a very different approach to a module. It's actually a 120 credit module. And it's assessed by 40 competencies. So they have to write a blog post for each of the competencies. And as they've started, they found writing very difficult. Um, but as they progressed, it started to get easier. <coughs> and one of my students is actually a professional basketball player. And he says, I'm really worried about these blogs, so I've got them all in draft, but I don't release them because I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing. You know, what is this reflection? Let's go through, through it again. And you know, I took him back to his game and said, you know, well, what do you do after your match? He says, well, we do this, this, and that. You know, we look at, you know, what went wrong and all, all the different things. He says, you've got it. That's reflection. So, <coughs> having this opportunity to give feedback, one of the nice things with the blogs is you've got the comment sections, 
so you can give the students feedback so if they haven't captured that straight away they can redo that so as I say it's a very diff different approach so it's not a case of pass fail if they don't write it correctly I can give them feedback and say well actually that's a good start very descriptive let's have a look at you know what you've learned and what you contributed uh, and give them that feedback gradually they've got better and better at the process now, I think once they get that um, stimulus to sort of keep them in the flow of, of, of doing it and, and start to recognize how it's useful you know hopefully they'll progress in, in further years to start looking at different spaces so they, they could choose that so this idea of a personalized digital space, digital toolbox if you like, um, is going to be theirs. But it does help, but it will take practice, you know, it's, um, it's going to need encouragement because some of them, you know, are going to find that, that quite difficult, um, but essentially you've got to sort of keep introducing this and, and uh, giving them feedback in the way. This is interesting, um, it's not something I've tried quite yet, but you know, there is the improvisational approach where, you know, just getting the students talking to each other and actually as a group reflecting on what they're doing, what's going well and sharing it. You know, this is practice that's done um, across all areas of sport and, and works effectively. And in other working environments, you know, where you have to feed back as, as a team. The other aspect is getting them to build a confidence vocabulary. So this this idea of reflection and becoming better at it is a way that they can then start to use the language that they need to when they're going to start looking for jobs, the CVs, um, their LinkedIn profile. So being able to talk about your skills and experience and your subject knowledge and your achievements, your strengths, your weaknesses, and all of these things takes some doing so you need to get to these kind of active words um, and essentially at the beginning they don't have that but gradually those those can be improved as they get used to um, to doing it so these are the um, shoe Sheffield Holland graduates uh, attributes knowledge application motivation engagement social responsibility creative and critical thinking Integrity and professionalism, research and inquiry, digital literacy, communication. And as a word, all these are the, the words that come out of it, you know, and the fresh reflections in there to be able to critically reflect, you know, to get to that stage and as a graduate have all of this stuff, we need to be able to scaffold that process because they need to become confident reflectors. And I think having that um, digital repository. Um, has the potential to be um, quite useful and of course we need to prepare them for the network era as it's described by, by Josh um, we know increasingly in the workplace they're going to have to use a variety of different tools so it also exposes them to a variety of different things that they can use to increase their digital skills and capability as well as their confidence in reflecting on, on what they're doing. That's it.